Hey there, everyone. Today we're going to be looking at Chapter 2, Technical Machine and War Machine, from Maurizio Lazzarato's Capital Hates Everyone, Fascism or Revolution. And this chapter is particularly interesting because Lazzarato is going to take the notion of the war machine and the assemblage from De La Zinguaterie, particularly as it features in a Thousand Plateaus, he takes a couple quotes from. Also, there's some stuff in Anti-Oedipus regarding um, capital and the deterritorialized flows that capital can accentuate. But this is a really interesting chapter for understanding the development of the centralization of decision-making in neoliberal capitalism. And this chapter has a lot of stuff, but I think one of the most helpful quotes for kind of getting a rough idea of Lazzarato's analysis is here on page 152, he quotes Deleuze and Guattari. This is from A Thousand Plateaus, and I hate that he doesn't quote the monograms in here. I think I know where it's from in A Thousand Plateaus, but I don't have my copy on me to cite it. But it goes, a technical element remains abstract completely indeterminate, so long as it is not related to an assemblage that it presupposes. What is primary in relation to the technical element is the machine. Not the technical machine, but the social or collective machine, the machinic assemblage that will determine what the technical element is at each moment, what its uses are, its extension, its comprehension. It is through the intermediary of the assemblages that the phylum selects, qualifies, and even invents the technical elements. And one of the big things that Lazzarato looks at in this chapter is this assumption that technology has reached the point of an automatism, that it has a sort of freedom of its own that has made violent interference unnecessary. And Lazzarato maintains that, in fact, a lot of the supposed decentralization that we seem to see with, like, automation, for example, where it seems like individual decision-making takes less and less of a part, it actually continues to be centralized more and more in places like Silicon Valley, for example, also the U.S. military, also key political actors like Trump or Bolsonaro. And he uses these vestiges of power, which are often, you know, sometimes overtly stated, sometimes not so overtly, in order to show where the decision-making power lies. And in kind of a very deleuze Guattarian fashion, he writes here on page 123, It is society as mega-machine that engenders, assembles, and organizes men and technical machines in the same process. So this kind of theory of the mega machine, you know, it's pretty similar to just the general notion of the machine developed particularly by Guattari, also by Gilbert Simondon. And the mega machine is humans plus signs plus enforcement techniques, basically. And the machine obviously doesn't just stand for like, like a factory machine. For Lazzarato, that is a technical machine. But you also have social machines, and this can be, I don't know, structures for behaviors, norms for how you ought to act, norms for what are proper working hours, what are proper working conditions, whatever it may be. And these all organize people and technology in the same swoop. So there's not this separation between humans and technical machines, such that, oh, technical machines just sort of make their own way on their own and they don't influence humans. No, we evolve at the same time. Now, Lazzarato chooses to use the notion of the war machine from Deleuze and Guattari because it gets rid of what Manuel de Landa calls reified generalities. This would be things like the social or society with a capital S. Lazzarato does this because the war machine maintains the connotations of violence. 
and of necessary continual intervention in disruptionary ways. He writes on page 125, The problem is that the anonymity of society and its mechanisms masks relations of war, class divisions, and various dominations. Power must be analyzed on the basis of its own strategies, which are always singular, event-driven, and unpredictable, following no other regularity than that of their affirmation. Consequently, I will abandon the generic and imprecise notion of social machine in favor of war machine, which implies the dominant and the dominated, relations between force on the basis of which norms, dispositions, and laws are produced, but also a certain amount of causing to die and violence, exactly as in the Egyptian mega-machine. So, right, just as Egypt used used slave labor in a way that the subjectivity of Egyptian citizens during the time of the development of the pyramids existed in the same machine as did, you know, the development of the inclined plane, for example, to help build the pyramids— you had that and the development of human subjectivity happening at the same time. So the war machine is sensitive to the singularity, the uniqueness of events, while also maintaining this connotation of force and violence. And this does something particular when looking at capital, because Lazzarato is very much privy to the analysis of capital as it's developed in Anti-Oedipus where Deleuze and Guattari look at the various strategies by which capital is consolidated, by which it exists, by which it expands through different moments in history, by a rather creative process. And this is a problem that people will get when trying to read Anti-Oedipus, is Deleuze and Guattari get rid of some of the naive notions of capital as just always bad because they focus on its mode of function, on its method of expansion, on its axiomatic nature, in a way that can make it seem very creative, very exciting, very interesting. And a lot of the accelerationists love to take up this angle that there's something creative and innovative about capital without realizing that capital reifies the despotic signifier, that being Capital itself is this abstract notion of value, which drives the creation of subjectivity and the orientation of behavior. So Lazzarato wants to look at capital through the lens of strategies of confrontation. And the look at confrontation maintains, as I talked about in the last lecture on the first chapter, the very real effects that this has on people. Lazzarato says, since the raison d'etre of machines resides in performance and even in maximum performance, they need environments that guarantee this maximum. And they conquer what they need. Every machine is expansionist, not to say imperialist. Each one creates its own colonial empire of services, comprising transporters, operational teams, consumers. The original machine grows, therefore, becoming a mega-machine. It also requires an exterior world, a colonial empire, that submits to it and does its bidding. No limit is placed on self-expansion. The machine's thirst for accumulation is unquenchable. Continuing its expansion, it becomes a global machine, a total machine, that succeeds in fully conquering the world. The world becomes a machine, a techno-totalitarian state constituted by a gigantic machine park. And the notion that every machine is expansionist and requires an exterior world is something the and Guattari were very privy to. That just like in colonialism, it requires an expanding market and it requires something assimilable, And then once it assimilates that, it has to redraw the goalposts and have something new to assimilate. So it requires expanding. Its very raison d'etre, as he says, is to expand and to work on this axiomatic of profitability, these capitals. 
And as such, it's going to align strategies which focus on the sites of conflicts, decisions, and strategies, as he says. So these are all events. And these events, of course, are going to realize themselves in different ways. For example, he talks about Trump as the supremacist war machine. He says, and yet every day in this chaos of information, the corporate boards, the big banks, the states, the mafias easily manage to select, elaborate, and extract strategies, political moves, and profits. The complexity, the overabundance of information, images, and discourses constitutes a serious problem for an individual submerged by these flows, but not for a social machine capable of selecting and elaborating them collectively, a collective composed of humans and non-humans. The war machine assembled by Trump orients itself, chooses, and decides in this jumble the problem is political before being technological. So the usage of technology, which, you know, Trump loves using technology, he used Twitter all throughout his, his presidency to hail all sorts of insults and whatnot. And as such, the various choices of words that Trump used was essentially a war machine, which focused on taking a group of supporters and orienting them like a phalanx against Muslims, against immigrants, against the left, which is the easiest reified generality of the 21st century. You know, it could be like the, the baby-eating lizard people of the, of the QAnon conspiracy system. And these objects of opposition don't really exist prior to their political instantiation and orientation within a social machine, which is going to be defined by these key actors like Trump, who organize the social field into a war machine. And particularly on the aspect of technology, Lazzarato writes on page 131, Trump is a new type of fascist and racist that can be called a cyborg. His consistency is inseparable from the technical machines, television, internet, Twitter, with and by which he exists as a political subject. Similarly, his electors exist and manifest themselves politically by those same cyber apparatuses. So right, Trump thrived off using Twitter and television, maybe it's like images of his rallies and whatnot, in order to, and Lazzarato says, order, threat, and insult. These are the characteristics of the media, which Trump appropriated in his use of the same media, turning them back against the elite who divided up the democratic governmentality amongst themselves. So, right, there's this inner war between Republicans and Democrats, which basically oscillates back and forth between the same underlying values of, you know, neoliberal global capitalism and this goes uncontested because someone like Trump can cover that up and use these reified generalities like immigrants or uh, the terrorists or the left or Biden in a way that, of course, this is, this is classic neo-fascist rhetoric. And just like Deleuze and Guattari, there's always a hidden optimism in Lazzarato's work. Because even though he's looking at these great social machines, these war machines that are able to mobilize, you know, kind of global systems of finance in order to lead to the oppression of millions of people, nevertheless, these systems cannot completely totalize the agents they depend on. Because there always has to be that outside world, there is always something which is yet to be dominated. And many people have pointed this out, you know, various theorists about the sort of inner third world that develops within the first world with like ghettoization and things like that. Even the inside serves as a sort of outside world that is being managed and contained and abused for the purposes of rich elites. <laughs> 
And as such, even within the quote-unquote first world, which is a regrettable term, but nevertheless, there is still totalization which has yet to happen. As such, Lazzarato writes on page 134, what is to be questioned, therefore, is not the omnipotence, but the impotence of these giant firms, their machines and their algorithms that are meant to govern us. Because they never manage to penetrate into the territories and networks that politically assert their independence and their political autonomy. These technical machines are very effective when it comes to isolated, desolidarized, fear-ridden individuals subjected to capitalist processing and placed in relation solely by the apparatuses of media democracy. But, confronted by a socialization, a taking of sides, and collective expressions of rupture, fascist or not, they suddenly become powerless. And as such, he says that all these various companies like he, he cites GAFAM, which is what Google, Amazon, something else, Apple, and Microsoft. He says that these are all essentially paper tigers whose weakness is not technical, but political. So the systems in place that are governing and allowing for certain behaviors, he, you know, he's using Mao's statement of paper tigers here, the weakness is political. So it is about the social organization that goes behind the usage of certain materials and people that is their potential downfall. So there's always this continual possibility for rupture in Lazzarato's work that is going to be reified in, for example, Algeria. So he's going to look at Fanon's analysis of radio in Algeria and look at the responses to and perception of media as something that is contingent upon the political situation. So, for example, the FLN, the Front de Libération Nationale, the National Liberation Front, which is the nationalist um, party in Algeria seeking independence against French colonization, they start this radio program called The Voice of Free Algeria. And they essentially take the radio messages that they had been receiving, which had been French. They had been dominated by, you know, all the stereotypes about Arabs that goes along with receiving those stereotypes from the outside and all this propaganda which made Algerians close their ears to the radio by creating this radio program by, quote, establishing a new relationship between the radio, technical machine, and its listeners, subjectivity, it undermined the colonialist functioning of the same technology. So like we talked about before with the, you know, this assemblage in the Deleuze and Guattari quote, Technical machines in and of themselves, of course they do material functions, but how that function works in a social system, whose benefit is working towards, is obviously you know, a question of power and a question of looking at the actual strategies of capital. But by shifting this relationship between technical machines and subjects, that being humans, the traditional functioning of radio as a method of colonial oppression can actually be shifted. He writes, In the Revolutionary War, the colonized became an active subject, even if he or she didn't participate directly in the political organization, because the radio included them in a community on the move, for which they would feel like an actor. And he mentions how the French services would kind of go back and forth with this war of the waves, where they would try to dominate different radio frequencies. And this led to the voice of Free Algeria being more like the phantasm of Free Algeria. It was constantly getting intercepted and scrambled by these French radio services, such that you could pick out little bits and pieces that were transmitted by the Algerian radio program, but mixed in with the French, such that 
the colonized learned how to select and develop information from a strategic point of view, as he says on page 141. So there's an inventiveness, a revolutionary subjectivity altered by the relation of the colonized subjects to technology, that being the radio, that allows people to start filling in the gaps of what they think is being said based on what they gathered. And he talks about how Fanon shows that this broke down the old patriarchal hierarchies. One could see fathers, mothers, and daughters listening to the news together. And he continues here on page 143 that Fanon knew, without waiting for the theorists to tell him, that the infosphere constituted a psychopathogenic environment. That being, it is an environment which generates psychopathology, which generates subjectivity. But contrary to the depoliticization which they ensure, he attributes many of these pathologies to colonialism's war machine and works towards the construction of a revolutionary war machine, to which he assigns the task, if not of treating them, at least of modifying the environment so that it is more favorable to a positive progression of the psyche. So we are looking at an appropriation of the means of production, you know, the means of production can now be the radio too because you're producing information. This is always a collective revolutionary exercise of essentially political action, which alters the functioning of technical machines. And in terms of looking at the development of technology, Lazzarato wants to look at how this development coincides with the same material, real oppression of human beings that he's mentioned in chapter 1. He says that, for example, cybernetics, that their development was the work of the U.S. Army, the greatest, richest, and most inventive entrepreneur that capitalism has ever seen. The expression creative destruction is almost perfectly applicable to it provided one reverses its terms, as it were, since here the creation has destruction as its objective. The U.S. Army contains in itself the reversibility of destruction and creation, of economy and war, of acting on an action and of violence upon persons and things, those dualities that constitute contemporary power. And this is something that Kathy Acker talks about in her essay, Algeria, on this blurring of the lines between legal violence and the sort of passivity that we are told to inhabit. That there's a sort of mandated violence by, for example, the U.S. Army that we can see in, like, the war on Iraq, for example, where there's this huge shock and awe bombing campaign that becomes essential to the acquisition, or at least the attempted acquisition, I should say, of Iraqi oil, such that capital is directly driving war, driving the creation of war, and driving the development of technology. That's something that Paul Virilio looks at in Speed and Politics. He look at, looks particularly at the development of intelligence technology and the way it changes war, such that Subjectivities of soldiers change, and also the kind of technopolitical aspect of war changes, as you can use like heat maps and statistical maps equally well to figure out the situation of a battlefield as if you were actually looking at it. In fact, you could do better by using these statistical maps. So the creation of like drone technology or ICBMs is contained in itself by the axiomatic of capital, of its expansions, of solving organizational problems. As Lazzarato writes on page 149, the development of science, technology, and communication slash information has both destruction and production as its end. Technology and science are just components of the war machine that are always that always combines, and irreversibly so from the beginning of the 20th century, Capital and war, production and destruction. So the kind of specialization of productive mechanisms requires a burgeoning market built on the back 
of violence and violence that has kind of changed from the colonial violence to something arguably more expansive, perhaps. And to really hit the nail on the head here, he talks of neoliberal politicians who guide this. And he says, you know, not only of politicians, but of like people in Silicon Valley, these kind of, these general people in power. He looks at Henry Kissinger, for example. And he says, once they were cleared of their military or even governmental affiliation, they appeared in everyone's eyes as cultural and economic drivers, as forces emanating from nature. It was then that the storytelling began of the innovative and genial entrepreneur, confident in the market and distrustful of anything resembling state intervention, capable of taking risks and of inventing a portable computer in his garage. I'm I'm thinking of like kind of Steve Jobs vibes here. A cosmic scam that is sold to us as a truth because the winners had the power to impose it. Silicon Valley is the fruit not of the spirit of innovative and of initiative of entrepreneurs finally liberated from bureaucratic tutelage, but of 50 years of huge public investments managed by the most hierarchized, disciplinary, murderous structure that has ever existed, the American army. Which is just like, that's a real damn moment in this book of just really hitting the nail on the head of a lot of the technological acceleration of industry is due to military. He confronts the theories of Jean-François Lyotard and also Jean Baudrillard, and he problematizes this notion that capital is just automatic, that it can exist in a sort of self-reifying situation where it kind of hyper-specializes its own system. This is very prevalent in Baudrillard in Symbolic Exchange and Death. And, you know, there are some nuances that I think are really fascinating that Baudrillard adds to this. But Lazzarato has a good point here that's very in line with the analysis of capitalism in De La Zinguetari's Anti-Oedipus, where he quotes, In capitalism, says Simondon, the machine is a slave that serves to make other slaves. And then he continues, This statement places us on the decisive path of power relations. For if the machine is a slave, it has an autonomy and independence that are completely relative. It must have a boss, a slave master, someone for whom it works and whose orders it executes. Simondon doesn't reveal to us the identity of that master, but Jodelaz and Félix Quateri give us part of the answer. We are always slaves of the social machine and never of the technical machine. The technical machine would therefore be subordinated to the war machine. It is the latter that gives form to the man-machine relation, for it precedes both the man and the machine, transforming the first into variable capital and the second into fixed capital. We will follow this thread in order to reopen the debate around the relationship between war and revolution. So, by putting capital and the machine of capital, the war machine of capital, back in this relative dimension where it depends on the semi-autonomy of its actors, and more importantly depends on the social machine, the assemblage, which is structuring the relation between man and machine, this gives us a way in to look strategically at the way capital is used and, for example, how humans are viewed as variable capital and machines as fixed capital. And this will lead into some very interesting analyses by Virilio regarding, you know, the, the acceleration of our perception of time and the speeding bodies of the vehicle, for example. This is going to give us a way to look at the changes in subjectivity that are re- the result of capital and changes in industry and changes in military, but also keeps in mind that we are slaves to relations. And this is something that Foucault was aware of, for example. Uh, you know, it's one of, my, one of my favorite quotes by Foucault, is that power doesn't exist. And he specifically says in another um, 
in another interview that power is a relation, not a thing. So what defines, you know, who has power is the set of relations, which is to say the assemblage that is guiding the socialization of practices, the sense that these practices make, so to speak. This is what guides what is, you know, what is inherently exploitative. One of the things that Lazzarato particularly wants to problematize is the duality between man and machine. And this is a common, you know, this is a common factor in post-humanist discussions surrounding this distinction between man and machine. I think Shannon Bell has some pretty interesting stuff on that. Also, Stellark is a great artist that I think has some really interesting work in this regard. But when looking at cybernetics... He wants to look at cybernetics and the notion of a machine that surpasses this anthropocentric subject-object dualism of, oh, man is the one that has all the autonomy and the machine is subservient and dependent on his input. Now, of course, machines can run off of programs which don't necessarily require constant human intervention. They do however, require the structuring of their axiomatics, which underlie the meaning of those programs, which requires the intervention of the individual, requires the questioning of the question, as Lazzarato puts it, which is going to allow for the machine to have a sort of semi-autonomy. So developing this mode of existence of cybernetics he writes here on page 161, the cybernetic machine as a technical individual is not a thing, a mere object, nor an objectification of human activity, but a mode of existence that is added to and functions in parallel with the human mode of existence. Neither of these parts can function autonomously, independently of the other. That's important. Machines and man are part of the same assemblage, but they're not separable. They require the organization imposed upon them by the assemblage, which is going to be defined by these strategic kind of modes of interaction that will be defined by those with power. But these operate parallel to one another. Their modes of existence depend on each other. He continues, Mode of existence signifies that the machine is not an absolute unity, a closed block, a substance that is an already individuated, already complete, dead thing, to use the language of Marx. The machine is open in several ways because it is relation and a multiplicity of relations. A relation to its own components, to other machines, to the world, the environment, and to the human. So, the being of technology here is not so much, you know, Heidegger was trying to figure out this being of technology, but Lazzarato uses Simondon's analysis to suggest that it is relation. So cybernetics and technology requires this interfacing between man and machine in a way in which, Lazzarato says, man and machine are an assemblage, as Jean Simon, right, that's a big deluso Guattarian term, hence a field of possibilities, of virtualities as much as constituted elements, machine parts, software programs, algorithms. But all of that must be framed in relation to the possibilities and constituted elements of the war machine. If the machine is open, if the machine is relation, it contains a margin of indetermination, and its individuation is not already given once and for all, for its functioning is adaptable and not rigidly constituted, like that of the automatons Marx speaks of, which are an inferior type of technology for that reason. So the assemblage that is defining the man-machine relation requires, and this is something that Deleuze and Guattari are aware of, is virtualities. I like the example that Manuel Dananda uses of a knife, where you think about what a knife is, 
And you've got all sorts of differences that make, you know, the isness of knifehood vary a lot. You know, you've got different lengths of blades, the uh, the sharpness of the blade, the contour of the handle, the material of the handle. Basically, everything can be different. But what defines what a knife is, is what it does. This is why you can use all sorts of other things as if they were knives, even though they may, you know, they may not actually be a knife. But you can kind of use it in the same manner and you're like, oh, this is close enough to cut my food or whatever. But in terms of what a knife can do in a certain environment, it can be used to cut food, to prepare food, to slide food into a pan, for example. Or, as Delanda says, it can be used to pin a scary note to someone's door, like a threatening note of like, you're going to die if you don't give me money or something. So the environment which is coded by virtualities, by, you know, the context of the situation that's kind of imminent to the situation defining, well, would this be perceived as threatening or not, for example, that constitutes the elements, these mechanical parts, these programs, these algorithms that Lazzarato speaks of. Just like with the knife, they're defined by virtualities just as much as their inherent materiality. And this is going to be structured in a war machine when we look at human society and we look at capital. Capital takes advantage of various pieces of infrastructure, of individuals when they work. All of this is organized around constituting elements. This can be man or machine or both. And an assemblage that is defined by conflict, by war, but also by revolution. Because just like war, revolution is an event too and can be used to affect capital. And that's one of the things that Lazzarato is trying to keep in mind. You know, hence the subtitle of this book, Fascism or Revolution. You have these sort of micro-fascisms of capital. And also, you have the macro-fascisms of the exploitation of entire countries through uh, outsourcing of labor, you've got the fascist side that's just circulating capital in this neoliberal order, and you've got the possibility of revolution. And continuing with the understanding of the machine, he looks at Catherine Malibu, for example, among others, to look at what exactly machines can do, and Malibu has this notion that, you know, and it's not her notion, of course, but she's the one theorizing in this work, of an automatism, of a full autonomy of systems which can regulate themselves. But of course, like I talked about before, it requires the imposition of a basic understanding of axioms which must come from outside. I mean, this is a basic understanding of like Godel's incompleteness theorem of there's always some presuppositions which must come from outside, from a relation to the outside, which can't be expanded upon, that cannot be fully understood within that system because it relies on axioms which cannot be self-referential, which require some relation to an outside. So in looking at technology versus humans, one of the things about humans is they have this unique ability to abandon their axioms. The the machine cannot. The machine is bound by basic axioms which are unquestionable and are requisite to its functioning. Lazzarato writes on page 170, the most ignorant slave refuses and interrupts in a radically different way than that of the machine and the technical machine. He interrupts the automatisms that regulate his servitude so as to neutralize their power and assuredly not to improve their functioning to achieve homeostasis, equilibrium. He interrupts in order to open up the possibility of converting his subjectivity and thus creating new orientations and new living conditions against his exploitation and his servitude. 
His revolt is anorganic and abiological. And that thing about achieving homeostasis, of being able to go beyond just regulating his servitude as a sort of uh, hyper-functionalization, that's referring to the fact that Malibu's talking about these machines, which can basically do a self-investigation of sorts. They can run diagnostic checks on themselves and they can basically hyper functionalize themselves they can look at things that aren't running properly and they can figure out okay how can i best fix this but that's creative in a sense but only to the extent that it relies on a fundamental axiom that it's trying to improve its own function it's trying to maximize its efficiency is a big one And this insistency on efficiency is something that humans can abandon or challenge. We can challenge this notion that our worth is defined by our profitability, by our marketability is a common one in kind of the social media lingo. That doesn't define us, and we can use our actions to essentially involute, as the Lozinguetari say, Instead of just evolving on a continuum, we can involute such that there's a radical break from axioms, which is the essence of creativity. And then one of the last points that Lazzarato points out is how traditionally, I say traditionally, it's only been a part of the discourse for the last maybe 50-ish or less years, the notion of automation is seen to give us back, you know, time that we would be spent working because now industry is more automated so people don't have to do some of these low-level jobs. It gives us back time. It gives us back freedom. It gives us back an autonomy we didn't have. And particularly that it reinserts some notion of decision-making, and power that we didn't have before. But Lazzarato shows that actually automation helps with hierarchy consolidation. Lazzarato shows how automation requires on the same axioms going into the technology that is now automating industry in a way where, for example, you can look at drones and they'll have imperatives like target only legitimate targets or define a threshold of proportionality between civilians killed and expected military benefits. But as Lazzarato points out, these axioms require a choice in advance, a decision about the parameters of the decision, a decision about the decision. It requires, you know, figuring out what is the definition of military benefits, or what is the definition of a legitimate target. This requires outside input, and with automation, you actually take the decision-making capabilities out of workers who are already becoming more alienated from their work, more forced to abstract themselves away and think of even like firing people in an HR department as a sort of game to be played. This actually just serves to consolidate hierarchically decision-making power into fewer and fewer hands. Lazzarato writes on page 175, The automatic machine centralizes decision-making even further. Instead of abolishing it, it exalts it. It gives still more power to the higher levels of the hierarchy. Machines, including automatic ones, always depend on an exterior element. Machines and humans are part of collective assemblages, social machine and war machine, that produce and reproduce them together. The problem is not to know who, man or machine, has the control. That is an undetermined formulation of the question. What is really in question is the material and political automization of that band of armed man that is first of all the state machinery. We will say rather that it is a matter of the war machine of capital, of which the state is just one articulation, And that automization is the technological realization of capital strategy of secession. A strategy that, as always, requires its subjectifications, its armed bands. So, this automization 
requires that fewer and fewer people are now in charge of the basic axiomatics which run the system of capital, even if even in its most deterritorialized state. So I hope this has helped understand a little bit this work. Um, very dense, lots of different subjects covered. I purposely didn't talk a lot about a lot of stuff because there's just so much stuff covered. Um, but read it. It's like 230 pages. It's, it's not too bad. So check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, gender studies, German idealism, other literature, post-colonialism. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. Maybe you need help reading some passage or talking about some philosophy problem. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one. Mm -hmm.